Welcome to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. Licensed clinical psychologist Dr. Levine brings viewers success stories by demonstrating how the brain works and neuroscience-based pragmatic ways to retain the brain to improve emotional regulation. So now, please welcome your host, Dr. Levine. Hello, this is Dr. Levine and welcome back to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. Today, I've asked Cheryl to join us. Uh, she was kind enough to be a guinea pig for some uh, questionnaires to help with awareness. So we're going to do a little banter back and forth of discussing how to fill out these questionnaires and what kind of things uh, you fill out. So <clears throat> this is the show that brings you uh, practical neuropsychology. And what I'd like to do is um, share my screen and talk about the second phase of uh, our um, program. That and if we'll be there in just a second. So here we go. <clears throat> As we've talked of before, that all change happens, transformation changes through three, three steps. First, you got to have a way of being aware of what you're doing. Second is set the intention for the change. And third, learning some new skills. So <clears throat> the first phase of our program, which if you've been watching our episodes and you certainly can go back and fill it in is First, we needed some stress relief and we needed to increase function, whether it's whether we're suffering from stress or anxiety or depression. Any of these things are on the stress continuum. And quite often, even if we have something else like ADHD, we'll have some stress which will impair our, our functioning or some pain can impair our functioning. So the first phase was a set of tools to help you actually get some relief from that stress and increase your overall functioning. But now <clears throat> what we're gonna do is the second phase is actually get a little bit more into the actual stress management and what lifestyle changes you're gonna make so that you can have a more balanced, uh, emotional balanced and balanced life. So today we're gonna talk about uh, stress management. The first um, part of this program is all about, or this phase was all about uh, exposure. And we did talk uh, quite a bit about exposure. Uh, and if you remember correctly, most of our, um, our troubles and functioning come from our reaction to our reaction. So if we try to avoid the stress of driving or we try to avoid uh, different uh, feelings, we're going to actually make them worse. And part of the process of uh, getting over things that used to bother us or stress us is to actually go through them successfully, which in psychological terms we call exposure. So <clears throat> when we went through the exposure session, and you can catch that in one of our previous uh, shows, one of the things we identified was that there's an ideal level of stress to be under. You want to be a little stressed. Obviously, if you're not stressed, you can't relearn or retrain anything. Full Johnny's head is on the desk. He's not learning much. But on the other hand, <coughs> if we're too um, anxious or too overwhelmed, we also won't retrain the brain. So there's an optimum level. So if we're having trouble with being stressed by driving, uh, we need to be in that zone, do some uh, driving. And uh, we talked about how to go about that. So catch that in a previous um, uh, session, uh, uh, previous uh, show. So today what we're gonna do is talk a little bit about uh, stress management. And 
in the short version, uh, what we want to do is remember that stress is not necessarily how we use the word in our society, which is uh, overwhelmed or uh, unmanageable. Uh, stress from a physiological standpoint, engineering point, can be any demand. So even uh, g uh, good demands can be stressful, like you could get a promotion. It's a good thing, but it puts demands on mm -hmm. you. So uh, what we want to do is learn how do we manage stress, because we all have plenty of it. Um, we have to set the intention that we're going to encounter and tolerate it and learn some new skills. And uh, today we're going to talk about inventorying stress. So uh, one of the things that uh, with stress is we want to understand how does it impact us. So back to our uh, slide about bottom-up and top-down processing. So we have a baseline uh, level of uh, stress hormones in our system. When we wake up in the morning, uh, we could wake up uh, hearing the birds chirp and <coughs> all ready for the day and just kind of in a calm state, or we could wake up <coughs> and we could already be at a five with yesterday's or last month's or last year's stress and all worried about all the problems and all mm -hmm. the things. And if we're starting the day at a five, as we go through the day, we have more demands, we're going to continue to go up and up. So one of the things that we want to do is, of course, maintain or manage our baseline, which comes back to how much cumulative stress do we have in our lives? And I will tell you that uh, if five is a worry and uh, is worried or anticipating or those kinds of things, um, and six on my, our scale is procrastination, avoidance, avoiding doing things, seven is where uh, we start noticing the physiological effects of the stress, which means difficulty sleeping, um, maybe, uh, you know, some tension in our body, stomach problems. Most people have a bit habituated to anything stressful less than a seven. In other words, most people will come to me at a seven or above and they'll say, I'm not stressed. <laughs> because in our life, you know, we, we're, we get so habituated to stress that it just has become the norm. I had a, a woman come into my mind body group and uh, she uh, was running a little late and she got to the bridge and down here in Fort Lauderdale, the problem is that the bridges, of course, are at the most inopportune times. So she started to go up and she said, I'm not going there. And she didn't. And the reason she did that is because <clears throat> she started getting used to not living with all the stress day after day. So one of the things is if we've lived our lives at a five or above, we're so used to it that quite often we don't think we're stressed. So that's the purpose of the inventory. Now, one of the problems we have is say we're already at a six, then when even the smallest problems happen, we're up at a seven, having trouble sleep, whatever. We have no capacity right. for more stress. So the purpose of today will be first to understand how stressed are we really, right? <laughs> Do we really have any stresses? And we're going to uh, do this uh, in, in, psycholo in psychology. We have a lot of inventories and I just picked a couple, but you can always use um, Google and just uh, put stress inventories and you'll find that there's tons of stress inventories. So I had Cheryl uh, fill out a couple and we'll, we're going to discuss 
the kinds of things you can learn when we come back from this uh, brief commercial. Uh, so stay with us and we'll get into actually doing some of the inventory work. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back to Dr. Levine's neuropsychology and the first inventory we're going to look at is our life stressors um, and what this will do is just kind of give us a feeling for what are the big stressful events that may have occurred um, uh, during the previous year to kind of understand where maybe our cumulative stress has, has been so this, uh, this life stress inventory was uh, built to predict, um, to predict uh, health consequences. So to just have a feeling for um, what can happen, if the score on this is 150 points or less, then there's a low susceptibility to stress-induced health issues, right? But 150 to 300 implies you're going to have 50% chance of some kind of health breakdown in the next two years. Mm -hmm. Now, that could be cardiac or it could be digestive because at the end of the stress response is the immune system. Mm -hmm. So we all know that if we're under a lot of stretch, we, we can catch more viruses and things like that. Mm -hmm. And particularly ever since COVID and all the respiratory stuff, right. there's a lot more health stuff going on. And if we're all the way at 300 points, then we're going to be up to about 80% chance. So that that's almost a given. Mm -hmm. If you have a lot of stress, you're going to have health consequences. So <clears throat> what I'm going to have uh, Cheryl do is just talk to some of the things that um, she inventoried, but just to give you an idea of the things that are the major stressors with the most points, obviously death of a Strauss is the, is the biggest, mm -hmm. but most of the relationship stuff, whether it's divorce or separation is also very high. Um, the tension, well, death of close family members, injury, getting married. 
Now, getting divorced is number one, but I guess getting married is half as much stress. <laughs> uh, being fired at work, I guess after the immediate relief, it yeah. can be quite a stressor, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, as we go down uh, the list, we end up with sexual difficulties. <laughs> You gave that a half score. Yeah, a half score. It wasn't like a full score. It was just a half score. Just too much going on and being too tired at night and unfocused and just not paying attention to my spouse. It's like half measures. Ah, so another stress-related consequence. <laughs> exactly. You know, there's consequences to everything. I hate when you, I've always heard that line. It's like, you know, hey, there's consequences to my actions. It's like, oh. So what it says here, um, major business readjustment. I'm, I'm transitioning to being semi-retired. I, I guess I could say I, I care less, but I'm not careless. I, I've been in, in the travel industry and it, we were riddled at COVID. It was absolutely insane and horrible how it happened. And then we set up into revenge travel. And, and I realized that um, I, I don't want to work real hard to, you know, deal with somebody that's going to go on a, three day trip and I'm going to make $20 and they're going to ask me 107 questions. Instead, I wanted to focus on a different kind of client, which I've done. So it's been a major business readjustment for me that I don't spend 12 or 14 hours a day at my desk, pounding on my computer working. And I'm only working a little bit here and there. And it's just that adjustment of finding out what semi-retired and kind of part-time is. So just changing your schedule significantly is a lot of stress, if nothing else. Right. So major change in financial status. You didn't check that, but you're making well, less money. Well, yeah, I guess you could say I'm making less money. So yeah, I, I discount things. I, I don't look at all the consequences in my life sometimes. So really, we kind of got another 38 points. Yeah, yeah. In there. So now yeah. I'm up to 208. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready for a meltdown, I think. Uh, okay. And, and um, so even um, one of the well, things I saw a lot during COVID here is this uh, uh, ma major change in the number of arguments with uh, spouse. They're a lot more, a lot less than usual. What happened uh, it, when this happens and in, in, uh, uh, when there's uh, some abuse in relationships, I see this a lot, is when uh, somebody gets stressed, then as they go up the scale of uh, stress causes us first to become kind of obsessive and ruminative and worry or uh, ruminating, then it works up to avoidance. So now what happens in a relationship is someone's getting more and more stressed, they'll start avoiding doing things or even avoid the spouse. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a lot of avoidance, which makes the relationship harder. But then you get to the point where um, you get to, um, you know, having trouble sleeping and eating and those kinds of things. So now you're cranky. Oh, so, yeah, so, I do. I do. I do yell at my spouse. So then, so then the relate. So then there's a lot more arguments. And then at eight, where it's got to be fixed now, compulsion is where the real arguments and the abuse comes in. So lots of times when it comes to, um, to relationships and abuse, stress is the major driver in this. And then it becomes kind of a cycle, as you can see here, if you have more arguments and whatever, then the relationship's more stressful and you have more uh, points in, in, the, in the table. But what happened with COVID is because each partner, their demands went up to deal with the added stressors, they were looking for help from their partner. Mm -hmm. So they were expecting more. And of course, 
the partner was overwhelmed and didn't have it to give. So then instead of the relationships uh, working towards uh, being a partner to solve the problems, now they added marital uh, difficulty to the list of other stressors. So one of the things, if you're finding that you're looking to your spouse for some help and support, and their complaint is they need more help and support, and you guys are arguing who's going to take care of the kids or pick up the groceries or whatever, recognize that probably both sides are overwhelmed and up on the stress scale. And this is when uh, you need to take a big time out and figure out how are you guys going to work together <clears throat> to get the overall demands for the household down. So this is a big area where uh, this is a big warning sign that if you're having more arguments that one or the other, or maybe both of the spouses are actually coming up on that scale. Well, something, I mean, it might not fit the whole model and stuff, but it's just that reminder that you're on the same team with your spouse and partner. <laughs> it may not feel like that, but you're on the same team. So I, I know myself, I need that reminder sometimes. It's very interesting that taking a mortgage is uh, almost as bad as foreclosing on a mortgage. Paying off a mortgage isn't on there, though. Uh, no. <laughs> so that was good. That's not a stressor. <laughs> okay. Um, In-law troubles. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, um, you know, obviously death of a family is a stressor. But maybe if that was a situation where the, there was a lot of in-law problems, it may actually reduce the overall mm -hmm. stress mm -hmm. if the person died, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and then, of course, major lifestyle changes, living conditions, new housing, moving, totally, totally off the wall. I know it's only 26 but or 25, but it might have been feeling like 75 or 90 for me this last couple of weeks. Um, and then this is the longer term effect. In other words, maybe short term, it may be a big stressor, but four months from now, you'll think, oh, I'm not under stress, right, from moving because I've been here for four months. But you're still adapting to the new environment. It's just not as big, so it's out of your awareness. One of the big problems with stressors is they, they fall out of awareness. But if you really think about a move, uh, maybe you had a favorite hairdresser where you were, right? Mm -hmm. So now a couple months later, you need to get your hair done. You got to go through the trouble of finding a new one, and she may not be the type of person mm -hmm. you like. So what happens is the reason these stressors are cumulative is because uh, there's two things that go on when we're stressed. One is there's a short-term recovery physiologically, right? If, if I haven't been sleeping well and I've been stressed for a few weeks, mm -hmm. well, it's going to take a while to recover. That's why we take vacations or some people take vacations, <laughs> right? It takes at least three days from major stressor to come down. Really? Yeah, to metabolize it all. And that's why we go for vacations for a week or two weeks and those kinds of things <coughs> we feel so much different. So it's important to understand is that we have both the recovery time from the phys physiology of the stress hormones and the lack of sleep and all those immediate physiological or could be if we've been eating because we've been stressed, mm -hmm. it may take four months to recover our weight, right? You know, maybe mm -hmm. the added weight is inherently a stressor. Like, you, you know, now every time you go up a flight of stairs, you're huffing and puffing. Well, you're going to release some stress mm -hmm. hormones if you realize that. So the recovery from a stressful period physically and mentally takes a certain amount of time. And then the second a uh, factor that causes the stress to be cumulative is we have to adapt. Mm -hmm. Lots of times uh, stress is a failure to adapt. Like what if 
you don't find a hairdresser that you like, then you're going to get mad every two months, right? <laughs> that you don't have a, your hair. <laughs> so the point we're trying to make here is to understand that uh, life events trigger stress. There's a phys immediate physiological impact, which can be stress hormones, gaining weight, losing sleep. There's a recovery period for that, which can take up weeks or months. And then on top of that, it may take quite some time to adapt to the change. Maybe if, you know, the death of a close family member, that person you talk to every day. Mm -hmm. So for the next year or better, you're going to be mm -hmm. triggered and stressed because every time you, something pops up that you would have called that person. So these things, uh, it takes a while to adapt to all these life events. And if you have a bunch of them happen in the same year, then that's going to bring your baseline up and you're going to have trouble handling more space, more stress. This inventory is great because it makes me really think about like when I filled out the form, you know, you even pointed out now, I, it's like, well, what about this? What about this? I had totally dismissed it. So not to say that you want to pin this on the refrigerator, but it just would help me, you know, it's helped me look at this and realize that there's a lot that's gone down that I need the time to process this all. And I guess mm -hmm. I have to be a little bit gentler on myself. I would help. And other people around me and not take it out on them because it's not their fault. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> change in uh, recreation. Yeah, exercising more, walking more, you know, getting outside, trying to get healthy, you know, that just, you know, it's like kind of the added stress is like, okay, do I have time to do this? You know, where am I going to put that into my day? You know, I know it's good for me, but it's like, how am I going to get this all done? You know, can make me more stressed. And of course, major change because you moved. Yeah, in the you know, social activities and friends and stuff and, you know, but at the same time, it it, it, it's, it works both ways. I mean, people know where I've moved to and other people have like said, oh, is that where you moved to? I'm going to come visit, you know? So it's like, it's all good, but it's different. And then major change in eating habits. Mm -hmm. Definitely can stress me out. And, you know, I, I was on with you earlier and talking about how excited I was about my, my intermittent fasting and my food and all of that. And I'll tell you, like the last month I know I've been like, and it's stopping now. Yeah. So a typical response at a six, seven level is to start doing the carbo eating because mm -hmm. of the stress response. Well, I grew up in a family that gains weight when they have the flu because our motto was eat something, you'll feel better. So when you first filled it out. Uh, 132. <laughs> but then when you went back. 170 and now Maybe. another 40. So I'm at like 210. Right. <laughs> so that being, it doesn't have to be too precise, but the amount of stress you've been under means that you got about a 50 50 chance mm -hmm. of having major health issues if I don't cap it down. You don't bring it down. Stop living at an eight and get back to a four. Yeah. Time, time for a serious <laughs> vacation. Oh, that's coming. There you go. <laughs> Okay, that's so, stressing me out too. <laughs> so as you can see, uh, one of the major things is uh, life events that accumulate can raise our baseline mm -hmm. stress levels. And what we're going to do after we get back from the break is we're going to take another inventory to understand how perception impacts stress. So come right back after this brief break to catch how perception changes stress. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching 
belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back to Dr. Levine's practical neuropsychology. And the next uh, area we're going to cover is perceived stress. So one of the formulas for excessive stress is uh, demands that uh, exceed perceived resources, Mm -hmm. right? So perceived, Mm -hmm. so let's, if you've ever uh, had an experience where something was just overwhelmingly awful and you get a good night's sleep and the next day you say what was the big deal yeah yeah okay so usually that's uh uh because our uh, actual resources or perceived resources uh are different so let's take a scenario um of a flat tire. Mm. Okay. Every demand has two types of, um, two types of, uh, coping required. One is emotional coping and one is, um, uh, problem solving coping. So we have a flat tire. Um, pretty much everyone who sees their flat tire has no poop, but the level of the O poop, and the level of the problem can change based upon uh, how they perceive the problem mm-hmm. and uh, the actual uh, perceive the demands and how they, uh, uh, what resources they feel they have available. So if I take the uh, situation where it's, uh, I, I'm running 10 minutes late for a doctor, a business meeting Mm -hmm. and it's pouring rain and I had a lousy night's sleep. So I come out and it's like worst disaster ever Mm -hmm. because I'm going to perceive the demand mentally. I'm going to appraise it as I'm going to screw up this business meeting and there's a good chance I'm going to catastrophize and I'm going to perceive this as a major business issue. It's no longer just a flat tire. So how I'm appraising the situation is very important. And with stress, there's two, or with emotions, there's two level of appraisal. There's our gut level, which is below the level of consciousness. And we can think of our brains as kind of like big AI devices that um, goes through all our life experience and gives us that gut reaction. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to, that gut reaction is going to be more in proportion to my past experience than my current experience. So that's the primary. I have no choice. I'm, my immediate reaction is high, maybe in this scenario, um, frenetic, and I'm having these thoughts of whatever. That's the primary appraisal. The secondary appraisal of my demand is now that it's in my consciousness, I can actually think through the situation, but I'm already pretty upset, right? Mm -hmm. 
So I have two options here. I can, in the secondary appraisal, I can chew on it and work it up, mm. right? Yeah, definitely. I, I can perceive <laughs> it as a big demand, like, oh my God. Worst stay ever. Worst stay <laughs> ever. Or I can start reappraising and reframing it and say, no, that business meeting isn't going to be the end of my career. I'll just call and uh, reschedule or whatever I need to do. Uh, so I can uh, work on the actual demand and the perception of that demand through the appraisal process. So that's the demand side. On the other side, we have perceived resources. Mm -hmm. We have actual and perceived <laughs> resources, right? So flat tires uh, um, are not a, that big a deal if I got a good spare and I'm pretty quick at fixing them, right? So if I have the skills, the resources, I, that's one option. So I got a lot of resources. So for a person who's good at changing flat tires, they got a lot of resources, right? Me. Or on the other extreme, uh, if I have two apps on my phone, one being AAA mm -hmm. and the other one being Uber, Uber I'm good. I got a lot of resources, right? Yeah. I'm good. So the level of both emotional, the mm -hmm. emotional demand, emotional processing can change with our resources. So whenever we're stressed by something, one of the first questions is always, can I change the level of resources? Mm -hmm. And then another might be, uh, what kind of emotional coping resources do I bring to the table? So if I find that I'm flew off the handle because I didn't get a good night's sleep, Maybe I need to look at my sleeping habits and make mm -hmm. sure I have more mm -hmm. of, you know, sleep as a resource or more time. Maybe I need to change my calendaring so that I have more time between for, appointments, for, between and, appointments yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So <clears throat> perception uh, in this case is reality, right? So uh, we're going to have uh excess stress to the extent that we appraise a situation uh, as very demanding. The more demanding we appraise it, uh, then the more stress it'll induce. And if we have lesser resources, which gets back to my, my couples where they are lacking the resources to handle the demands and they're saying, hey, if you could just give me a couple hours of your time, I'd be all set this week. <laughs> Right. Or yeah. like the couple uh, got married and he said, I'm only short a couple hundred dollars a month. Now, if you kick in a couple hundred dollars a month, we'll be all set. So uh, one of the, so what's important here is to be able to evaluate how are we actually perceiving or praising our environment and the uh, so I had Cheryl fill out the perceived stress scale and given what, uh, and this is a more near term inventory. The other inventory we looked at was, okay, over the last year, what's, what's some of the baselines things going on in my life that are going to be demanding, right? Mm -hmm. This is more in the, sh in the last month, how have I really been seeing things? And this is where you can understand, uh, have I been doing a great job with appraisal? Uh, and how am I doing it? Really perceiving things. So uh, in the last month, how often have you been upset because something happened unexpectedly? <laughs> a lot. Uh, a lot. So yeah. give us an example of how that is. Something that happened unexpectedly. In the process of selling my house, I had replaced our refrigerator and it stopped working. I mean, it just like it stopped working and I called for service and they came to fix it and it wasn't fixed. And five days later, it just started working again. And then three days later, it stopped working again. And it's like, I mean, it's like it happened unexpectedly. I had no control over it. I mean, I expect things to work. That's my big problem. I expect things to work. I expect technology to work. I expect refrigerators to work and I don't expect to have flat tires. So I don't do well when something like surprises okay. me. So your appraisal of things is lacking. 
if you expect things to work all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have unrealistic expectations of machines. <laughs> all right. Well, we know some part of the appraisal process that Cheryl can work on. <laughs> Okay, so in the last month, how often have you been upset? Uh, okay, in the last month, you felt that you were unable to control important things in your life. Well, totally, because it's I was depending on real estate agents and closing companies. And, you know, I have no control over what those other people do, but it was like totally impacting the, me getting my move done. I mean, it's like... Like I said, I, I have very unrealistic expectations. I used to have a, a little paperweight that said, he who expects nothing is never disappointed. I guess I need to find it in all of my stuff and put it yeah. on my front of my face. So I think the operative word here is important. Maybe everything is a 10. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I have the capacity to go from three to 10 in like two sec. well, a minute and a half. And then sometimes I can go back to a three quickly. But a lot of times I stay at a 10 or a nine or an eight or a seven, because I'm going to be compulsive and driven and make things happen. Even if I don't have control, I'm going to, I mean, I bang on my mouse to make my computer work. You know, I can't control that stuff. Why do I do it? How important yeah. is it? I'm not even going to remember a month from now. I mean, just like a, with the other survey, I didn't remember stuff had happened over the last year. You know, it's like it wasn't that important, but so, at the moment it was. So in the secondary appraisal we talked about, right? Mm -hmm. One of the questions you can always be asking yourself is, what are the consequences? What are, consequences. I know, <laughs> what are the consequences? Because... It's, it's not life-threatening. It's not the end of the world. It's not going to matter. None of this is that important. So on that oh, note, on that note, it's time. Reset. It's time. <laughs> Retrain the brain. It's time, for, it's time for those sponsors again. So <laughs> as one of the things, uh, come right back after this break and learn some other things about how the <laughs> appraisal process actually works and how you can reframe and reappraise the situation to reduce your overall stress. See you after the break. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like, I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology with Dr. Levine and Cheryl. And today we're discussing appraisal of stress. You're watching us on Bold Brave TV. Catch us every Monday at 11 a.m. 
So, Cheryl, we got down to uh, let's look at some more of your threes and wrap <laughs> this up. In the last month, how often have you felt nervous or stressed? A lot. How often have you found that you could not cope with all the things you had to do? A lot. Again, back to the resources. Not exactly. Feeling... And, and it all got done. And in the last month, how often have you felt difficulties were piling up so high that you could not overcome them? Sometimes. So overwhelmed. Yeah. So there are um, some uh counter appraisal questions here which number four four which how often you felt confident about your ability to handle your personal problems it said that i had to change that to a one if i was a three and and truth be told now that i'm this side of this last month even as crazy as i thought i couldn't handle things i handled it all i handled it all and it and i when I stop, which I don't do, I, I jokingly say I should have red fingernail polish because I do this all the time. And if I see the red, I'll stop. When I stop and do what I learned and heard to do, it's okay, but I don't do it. I don't practice this stuff enough. So one of the distress tolerance skills we learned was stop. Yeah. The acronym stop, which was stop, uh, observe, uh, what was it? Stop, stop, take a step back, observe, and then proceed mindfully. Right. 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 So, so I just need to do a lot more stopping. Right. Um, what was the next one? The other ones were five. In the last month, how often have you felt that things were going your way? Because I answered sometimes it said to leave it as sometimes. Right. So, uh, again, half full half empty type of right. appraisal and the same with number seven you know controlling irritations in my life again it was sometimes because if i stopped and i did what i know to do and learned to do i i can handle it i i can handle it sometimes you know i i've got the bandwidth to do it and then of course the last one was in the last month how often have you felt that you were on top of things that again was the sometimes Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. I think I can, I think I can't. So it's just my awareness of it, my perception of it. And it has been yeah. very distorted. Yeah. So this gets back a little bit to the self-talk, right? Oh, my when, mind is a dangerous when, neighborhood. When we're feeling overwhelmed, we tend to actually say, I can't handle this, this is too much, all those kinds of things. And when we do that, we're reinforcing a lack of confidence and reinforcing that overwhelmed feeling, right? right? right. So one of the big uh, mantras I, I work with my clients who um, uh, do a lot of anticipation, mm -hmm. people who, uh, one of the things is a lot of people say, I don't worry, right? I'll say, oh, okay, why don't you worry? They'll say, well, because I figure out what's going to go wrong and I fix it first, right? <laughs> I'll say, oh, I'm glad you don't worry then. How does, how does anticipating things going wrong feel? Very stressful. <sighs> and so, uh, well, you know, the part of that process of being stressed like that and being worried about things going wrong in the future, that anticipation is you're feeling all the stress of the future in the current moment, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the mantras I, I have people do in self-talk is instead of saying, you know, this is gonna go wrong or that's gonna go wrong and their self-talk is just to like, if I can handle it then, then I'll probably be able to handle it now. Mm -hmm. And if, I've handled similar situations in the past and survived, I can handle it. So one of the key self-talks when you're concerned about something go wrong, besides the practical analytical uh, problem solving of saying, uh, figuring out how you can deal with it or that you've dealt with in the past, probably from an emotional coping situation 
is just to remind yourself and maybe even vision a similar situation where you handled it really well. Because your stress goes down if you perceive you have the resources to fix it, right? So it, it's not even do you really have the resources, but if you're blocking out, well, say you're actually pretty, I know one of the constant things with you is you're actually very good with computers. But you never, you never remind yourself when something's going wrong that, hey, I'm good at this. Well, I have to say <clears throat> this last weekend has been crazy because it was my final push to like really get my house settled. And, you know, a fully packed trailer and two car loads later, I mean, that was Friday night, Saturday afternoon. I actually, not to be manic and, you know, compulsive, but I was able to have a friend come to this new house and show it off and feel excited. And I kept giving myself at a girls and asking for high fives back with like, look at all I did. Look at all I done. Look at how it's come out and it's all perfect. And it almost looks like a staged house now. So, you know, I know my self-talk improved a little bit the last couple of days. And maybe it's because my sleep has been better and I've realized I have the resources to do things and make things happen. And I told myself, I have till June. Mm -hmm. I don't have to have it done by April 8th. Oh, well, that's a good, right? Yeah. If you give, yeah, yourself, yeah so. give yourself resources and it reduces the amount. Yeah. My self-talk, I gave some pats and right. it, I think it, this would be different if I filled this out now. Hmm. I really do. So once again, uh, another inventory. The first one was uh, life events mm -hmm. and how they've accumulated over the last year and how it kind of sets the stage. Uh, and then uh, basically how am I perceiving my situations so I can see how much that emotion of being under stress has impacted how I'm seeing mm -hmm. new stress. Right. Because once you hit a five or a six on the scale uh, in the, the lens you're looking at everything through is I can't handle this. Right. And mm -hmm. you're once you're at a six and avoidance, then yeah. everything becomes yeah. a big deal. Yeah. And now demands like a flat tire or uh, the cleaners losing your shirt or all these things become much bigger demands because of the emotional coping gets bigger and bigger as you continue to get pushed up the scale. So um, what we're doing here is discussing uh, discussing stress, mm -hmm. right? And how chronic stress can impact health. Mm -hmm. And just some looking at how some life events uh, have impacted your baseline. Mm -hmm. And most people underestimate the amount of stress. <laughs> I, I rarely have anyone say, oh yeah, I'm stressed. They habituate. It's the same thing like if you live next to an airport, mm -hmm. you stop hearing the airplanes after a while. Well, if for five months you've been dealing with the move, you're going to stop feeling the effects of the yeah. move consciously, yeah. Yeah. but they're still there. Okay. So we've looked at how stress accumulates and then uh, we can tell how that accumulated st stress is impacting how we're perceiving uh, new demands on us right now by how we're reacting and appraising right. them and how important that to understand that we have to do the secondary appraisal. Mm -hmm. That primary gut mm -hmm. feeling mm -hmm. is just telling us something's going wrong. <laughs> it's not telling us how bad it is. And that's the purpose of the secondary appraisal. Mm -hmm. So, and in psychological terms, we call that reframing and how reframing or reappraising, we have the options of working it up by, oh my God, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. Or we can work it down like, I'll be okay, even if that bill doesn't get paid or if that check bounced or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
because we get the uh, the actual demands more in check. Awesome. So you've been watching uh, Dr. Levine with his guest, Cheryl. Uh, we've been discussing how do we understand how stressed we really are. And stay tuned to future episodes where we'll actually cover what are some of the life balance changes we can do and the things we can do to be less stressed and less anxious and less depressed and uh, have more resources to deal with the demands that we have left. So thank you once again for watching us. We're here every Monday at 11 on Bold Brave TV. See you next week. This has been Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology Show. Break old patterns and easily change negative habits with lessons that keep rewarding you for the rest of your life. Here Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave TV Network.